Uh, what I thought I'd talk to you about uh, for the next hour is give you kind of the entire semester in an hour, um, and we'll see how uh, successful we could do that. In talking about uh, how the lean startup kind of now has been uh, working in corporations, how to apply lean methodologies that early stage ventures have uh, uh, adopted and see uh, how they would work inside of large companies. Um, how many of you from uh, working in or, or are in large corporations now? How many, and how many of you in startups? And you're actually sitting next to each other. That should be interesting. Uh, let's see if you could actually talk to each other as well. Um, but if you're in a large corporation, you know you're being disrupted 24-7 right now, right? Disruption in telecom. Anybody recognize one of these, right? If you're a, right? Anybody recognize one of these, right? Um, you know, disruption happened literally in the blink of the eye. In, in video distribution, anybody know what this thing was? I mean, for the, yeah. Well, now we use this thing. Um, you know, automobile business. You know, whoever thought like it's a hundred years, takes billions of dollars, no one will ever start an auto company. Boom. Right. Um, you know, in the space launch business, you know, like who's going to build a new rocket company? United Launch Alliance has not only the best rockets, they got the government in their pocket. Oops. Huh? Oops. We're being disrupted 24-7, and companies, large corporations, are having to deal with disruption in a way they never had to before. In the 20th century, the corporate life cycle, that is from startup to kind of decline to, to going out of business, lasted about 60 years. 60 years, a public company would stay on the New York Stock Exchange. In the 21st century, the average is about 20 years, and it's declining. And you all kind of read the papers, you understand why. China is a manufacturer. China is a, is a customer. Startups being funded at a scale and, and, and rate and with dollars never imagined before, all targeting large corporations and their most profitable businesses. Internet making pricing transparent. Internet is a new channel. The whole list goes on of what corporate CEOs are, and corporate management is faced with in the 21st century. In fact, the thing I remind my students today is all the Jack Welsh rules of the 20th century. Everybody know Jack Welsh, right? GE, great, right? All the Jack Welsh rules of the 20th century, if you were to do them now, put you out of business. In fact, with all due respect to any alumni who've taken classes probably five years ago or more, everything you learned about entrepreneurship is probably obsolete. <laughs> so time to go back, talk to Rich Lyons. I'm sure there's some great exec ed programs now. They'd be happy to sell you. Um, but, but the key point is, it isn't that we were dumb before, it's that the world has changed. This is a big idea. The world has changed. And for most of us, you know, particularly if you have gray hair, you tend to stick with what you learned in business school or some of those great management techniques you learned when you went to school here. Those kind of sticky, you still got those dusty books on your shelf, and you know, anybody who still buy books? You know, those are the things, <laughs> dead trees. In fact, I think now, you know, the Kindle folks are, are missing a great opportunity because when you buy a digital book, it doesn't come with that nice shelf, so I think we should s sell spines of books, don't you think? <laughs> and so with, isn't that a new opportunity for some entrepreneur? It, it, it turns out for large companies, your competitor's speed is a threat. Their speed in technology, their speed in using new channels. Your enemy is time. And the way large companies can mitigate that is by continuous innovation, by adapt, uh, adaptability, and using some lean startup principles that we'll talk about in a second. But I want to remind everybody, Silicon Valley has been operating at speed for 50 years. We've been doing speed and urgency through desperation <laughs> for 50 years. But not just speed and urgency and technology, we've actually figured out how to innovate with speed and urgency. And I believe companies can do this as well, and therefore the purpose of this talk uh, this morning. So one of the things that's kind of interesting, um, I, I, uh, for those of you who don't know, the, how many of you have heard about the lean startup methodology? Any of you? Oh, OK. Um, uh, and those of you who haven't, just ask the person next to you. Um, uh, 
as Haas alumni, by the way, for those of you who have heard of Lean, it started about 50 feet from here. I taught the first Lean innovation class uh, called customer development here at Haas 12 years ago. In fact, the first ideas about Lean methodologies um, happened uh, when I retired in 1999. I had done eight startups in 21 years. I had uh, four IPOs, but what generated Lean was nothing about those successes. It was actually I had two craters, so uh, two failures, uh, so so bad they left craters so deep they have their own iridium layer. That's uh, <laughs> um, and, and in fact, uh, my next to last startup, um, I was on the cover of Wired magazine, and as I was looking at the cover, um, I realized that I was going out of business. <laughs> and 90 days later, I did. Um, and so I called my mother, who was a Russian immigrant. English wasn't her first language, still after a long time in the country. So every time I talk to my mom, I know I have to pause as she translate in her head. Um, and so I called her up and said, uh, Mom, uh, you know, I'm just calling you to tell you I lost $35 million. <laughs> pause, translate, and she said, logically, where'd you put it? <laughs> I, 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 I said, no, 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 I, I lost it, like spent it, it's gone, you know, it's like, yeah. and pause, longer pause, and then she said, oh my God, the country we came from is gone, we, there's nowhere else for us to go, and, and then she thought even more and said, and her name is blank, we can't even change it, um, <laughs> and so, a ton of those lessons ended up in the Lean Startup methodology, which I'll share with you in a second. But now back to large companies. It turns out about 20 or 30 years ago, McKinsey, anybody heard of McKinsey? Any McKinsey folks in the room? Any McKinsey folks in the room? You should be proud of this one. Um, Bagby, Coley, and White came up with this idea 20 or plus years ago that said, look, the way to think about innovation in large corporations is let's put them in buckets. Three horizons of innovation. That is, let's just characterize how we do innovation in three horizons. Horizon one is kind of our mature businesses. Horizon two are our rapidly growing businesses, and horizon three are emerging businesses. Now, I looked at this and said, how do we update this for the 21st century? Well, it dawns on me that those three horizons of innovation, which is a great way to start talking about innovation in large companies, is to find whether your business model is being executed, extended, or searched for, explored. So execution, it's a known business model. By the way, a business model is basically all the parts of commercialization that creates value for, for your customers and your company. You need to know who the customers are, what the value proposition is, what product market fit is, what's the right channel, what's the right pricing, what activities you need to do. That is, all those components make up a business model. You could also extend the business model, or you could have an unknown one and search for them. And what I found is if we start overlaying what we know about a business model onto McKinsey's three horizons, we get something kind of interesting. That is, horizon one really is the existing business or mission model. This typically is process innovation inside of a large corporation. You're adding more features. You're making the supply chain more efficient. You're changing pricing. You're making competitive moves. In Horizon 2, your business model is kind of known, but you're extending it. What's an extension of a business model? I'm going to add an additional channel. I'm going online. Or I might be targeting a different customer segment with the same product. Or I understand a customer segment perfectly well, but I'm Procter & Gamble. I have this huge manufacturing and research group. Let me come up with a Swiffer a whole new product category, but existing business model, existing channel, et cetera. Those are Horizon 2 innovations. But Horizon 3 innovations are disruptive. You know nothing about the business model. What's a great example? Well, from tech, Amazon Web Services. From this book company? What the heck does this? Turns out it's one of the most profitable, if you've seen the numbers for Amazon. Uh, they are basically the computing utility for the world. Or the canonical version in Silicon Valley is Apple and the iPhone. What on earth did Apple know about first the iPod and then the iPhone? What did they know about those businesses? Almost nothing. Pure disruption inside those large companies. So for me, these three horizons start us 
to begin to have a conversation about types of innovation in large corporations. And I want to emphasize that the distinction between Horizon 1 and Horizon 3 is the distinction between searching for a business model and executing a business model. Large corporations are built around execution of known business models. It's a big idea. You know who your customers are. You know who your channel is. You know pricing. You know competitors. You know everything. At least this week you do. But in a startup, startup you really don't know anything. And in a disruptive or new opportunity inside a large corporation, you also don't know anything. Now, by the way, if I'm looking at this from the perspective of a large company, your capabilities and risk assessment differ. In Horizon 1, this is my existing business. It's my existing capabilities. I have all these skills. I have a great sales force, have great manufacturing, wonderful engineering, low risk to do product line extensions here. You know, if I want to get into a new channel or new products for existing customers, there's moderate risk. But Horizon 3, well, these are crazy bets. And that's a big idea, because when you do a Horizon 1 bet, you have pretty close to certainty that that's going to be successful. And you just need to make one bet. But in Horizon 3, mistakes large companies make is treating them like Horizon 1 bets. You know, after 50 years of venture capital, VCs don't invest in one company per fund. They invest in a portfolio. And therefore, Horizon 3 bets in existing corporations also need to be innovation portfolios rather than single innovation bets. Make sense? Um, the other thing is how do you, in a large corporation, allocate across the horizons in terms of dollars? Now, this differs per industry, but in the tech industry, innovation allocation kind of looks something like this. 60 to 70 percent of dollars spent on Horizon 1, 20 to 30 percent Horizon 2, and depending on your corporation, you're making small but important bets in Horizon 3. The other thing to think about is what's the return on investment by Horizon? And this one almost always kind of messes up large corporations. Hey, we got it. Let's go you know, do, do disruptive stuff. Let's put our money on this, and we'll see returns in the next quarter. <laughs> well, you know, you're lucky in Horizon 1. You could get some ROIs within a year or two, and you do that by improving or partnering or acquiring Horizon 2. You could extend that model, but the ROI is longer. And Horizon 3, though, if you're doing these internally, these are long-term bets. And again, iPhone, Amazon Web Services, et cetera, are great examples of internal R&D that took a while. Now, obviously, you could shortcut this in a large corporation by acquiring disruption. But you need to understand that the ROI for a Horizon 3 is not going to appear for the next quarter. Make sense? Now, what's really interesting is to build Horizon 1 organizations we become experts at key performance indicators. We have HR manuals. We have legal guides. We finance could tell you, you know, down to the quarter. In fact, we have five-year forecasts, planning horizons, strategy groups. And by the way, you know, we kind of incent our employees with promotions and bonuses. And so following process and procedure in Horizon 1 is all about execution. And if you do it correctly, at least for a while, it equals profit. So you would think, OK, I got it. Horizon 3, it's just a smaller version of Horizon 1. Well, it turns out, in Horizon 3 initiatives, that equals death. You use the same process and procedure and personnel and financial metrics and legal and fine and branding and whatever. You've just killed your, uh, your innovation initiatives. You strangled them in its crib. Horizon 3 does something very different. They're searching for product market fit. 
They're doing pivots. They're trying to be agile, and they're taking risk on a scale that will rattle your CFO's teeth. <laughs> and at the end, there's a large reward, but most often failure. Now, what's really interesting is how do you keep both inside a large company? And this is what's kind of gotten us screwed up for 50 years, is trying to do innovation as a permanent process rather than an exception inside of large corporations. So disruptive corporate ventures, Horizon 3, and startups share the same characteristics. It's a big idea. Startups and Horizon 3 initiatives in large companies are identical. Whoa. Well, that's interesting, because what have we learned in the last couple of years? So Horizon 3 operates with urgency. It's not burdened by existing customers, channel, or inventory, just like a startup. It has its own processes, procedures, and KPIs, and everybody's focused on a single mission and survival. This is a spec of a startup. Now, what's really interesting is defining what a company versus a startup is. Companies are a permanent organization designed to execute a repeatable and scalable process. Right? You've already, in the early days of the company, found a, a repeatable business model. And now you've built the machinery to execute it. How do you know? Do you have KPIs? Yep. Do you have job descriptions? Yep. Do you have a sales plan? Yep. Does the street, Wall Street understand what your you know, earnings per share should be? Yep. Okay. You have a repeatable and scalable execution machine. Of course you could screw it up, but you know what it's supposed to look like. In contrast, and here's what we never understood, is that startups are a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. This distinction between search and execution was articulated for the first time here at Haas. This is the basis of what the lean startup is. Because we had spent 100 years in business school developing strategies and tactics and organizational theory for execution of a business model. Why? Well, what does the word MBA or acronym MBA mean? Master of Business Administration. <laughs> big idea. No, no, big idea. It's not a pejorative. MBAs made the American century of innovation and execution. But it was designed to give you tools to execute a known business model. The light bulb we had here at Haas was we didn't really have too many tools to search for business models. And it wasn't that other people weren't thinking about that we needed them. It's a whole history of corporate innovation. But where I came from was asking, do we have any tools for startups? to search for business models? And the answer was, not really. And so the Lean Startup was our attempt to build a management tool set that paralleled the tool set for execution. Make sense? And so startups run Lean. And let me give you my summary of what the Lean Startup methodology is, and then we'll tie it back into how it would work inside a large company. The Lean, method, the lean methodology is essentially as I said, trying to build a management stack, a tool set, for searching for business models. And at the end, because we collect a lot of data, it actually gives us evidence-based entrepreneurship. It actually turns entrepreneurship into something with discipline and rigor, rather than, gee, we're allowed to bring our dogs to work and have free food and, you know, whatever. Um, which used to be what I used to think it, it was all about. <laughs> Lean has three parts. Part one says, look, what we do in existing companies, when we have a series of knowns, we could write a business plan. And we could write a five-year forecast. Why? Because we know our business. We know our competitors. We know our channel. We know our, you know, everything else. But in a startup, we really don't know any of that stuff. And in fact, First derivative of not knowing all that stuff means in a startup, no business plan survives first contact with customers. <laughs> it's a big idea. 
And in fact, what Silicon Valley investors did for the first 50 years is tell startups, is, nah, 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 you're nothing more, implicitly, you're nothing more than a smaller version of a large company. So large companies write plans, we want you to write a plan. Large companies write five-year forecasts, we want you to write five-year forecasts. And large companies do alpha, beta, you know, first customer ship, and then, you know, have the bags of money come in. You make sure your office is big enough so you could have those bags of money coming in. And yet we never seem to be surprised that 90% of those startups would fail. Well, obviously it was all about the people, couldn't have been about the plan. Well, now we realize is that the only people to require five-year plans on a series of complete unknowns, five-year plans on a series of complete unknowns, here, get ready for this one, is the Soviet Union and venture capitalists. <laughs> and, 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 and therefore, when I woke up, I said, am I the only one to kind of like, it? and it turns out I was. Um, and, and this was the core of, because we had no other language or tools to describe, business plans are great for situations where you're executing a series of knowns. But here we're describing a series of unknowns. So what should we use here? And the answer was, we don't even know. So that's what the lean methodology is all about. Lean methodology starts with a very different assumption. Since you don't have any knowns, you have a series of unknowns. And because at Haas, you pay a lot of money to go to school, we called those unknowns hypotheses. <laughs> but outside of Haas, we call them guesses. <laughs> and the way we articulated all those guesses is we used something called the business model canvas, designed by a guy named Alexander Osterwalder. And so if the first part of Lean is simply a single diagram one page that articulates for a new venture about 80% of all the things you need to know about commercialization that on day one are just effing guesses. I'll let you fill in what the effing is. Um, meaning you don't really know who your customers are, you have an opinion. You really don't know what your value proposition is, which is a fancy business school word for what product or service you're building, and you're guessing about your revenue model. And you're definitely guessing about your costs, um, at least for the students whose plans I look at. Um, uh, so part one, we make you write all this stuff down in little yellow sticky notes, no plan, because the second part is, by the way, it's, this is how you create and deliver value for the company and customers. We're going to use this to frame the hypothesis. And step two in the lean is the part I invented. And, and by the way, these are all the questions you ask, and there's a whole book on this, Osterwalder wrote too, business model generation, and the second one is value proposition design. You should have them on your shelf, or at least pretend you read them. Um, and, and since they're all pictures, it's actually great, uh, versus my books, which are turgid text. Um, uh, but these are the questions you kind of ask. But the second part is the part I invented. As Rich mentioned, here at Haas, I realized there are no facts inside your building. So get the hell outside. That is, we used to operate, and I did this in multiple startups, and I see large companies doing this all the time for new ventures, is maybe if we talk to each other enough, we could somehow figure out what customers' needs and wants. But we now know there is no possible way that sitting in the room, conference room, laboratory, et cetera, then you could be smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers. It's a big idea. And the customer discovery methodology simply says, we're going to take all those hypotheses, every one of these, treat them as hypotheses, and now as we're building, we're going to get out of the building and start searching for the truth behind those hypotheses. We're going to try to validate or invalidate or refine those hypotheses with a formal methodology called customer development. It's how we turn the business model into facts. And we're going to do this at speed. And I'll show you what speed looks like in a second. So we're going to turn these guesses into facts. And we're going to do this in a way that not only appeals to business people, but blows scientists and engineers out of their socks. The reason why? is the customer discovery and development methodology has been done for the last 500 years. 
It's the scientific method. It's why the National Science Foundation adopted this class as the basis of commercialization of all science in the United States, which I'll show you in a second. But basically, it says, hey, we have a hypothesis. It could be about a customer, about a channel, about pricing. Well, let's design an experiment. Let's run that experiment, get the data, derive some insight, and validate, invalidate, or modify the hypothesis. How hard is that? Well, we never used to do that in business school. We just kind of assumed that since we had a, something we wrote down in our plan, and it was formatted correctly, <laughs> and we had the right sections according to our business school professor, then therefore, all we needed to do was execute the plan. By the way, the third part of Lean, only three parts, is we're gonna build the product differently than we did in the 20th century. My first student, Eric Reese, who I'll admit it now, 12 years later, actually snuck into the class, um, <laughs> was the first one to, maybe we could send him his check for tuition now, um, <laughs> came up with this observation that says, Steve, people in the 21st century are no longer building products in a serial basis, which is called waterfall. Right? We spec the product, then we go into development, then we go to alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. In the 21st century, we kind of now realize we could build products, hardware, software, even drugs, or even anything else, incrementally and iteratively. And that's called agile engineering, in contrast to waterfall, which is a serial process. And so the third part of Lean is we're gonna build the products incrementally and iteratively, getting feedback way before we would normally ship the product. And that allows us to build something called the minimum viable product. This phrase MVP is the smallest feature set that gets us the most learning. Remember those hypotheses? You might have a minimum viable product to figure out who your customers are. You might have a, another one very different to test pricing. Might just be a fake price list. Might be another one to just test feature set. It's not a prototype, and it's not a deployable version. It's what enables a test of a hypothesis. It could be a drawing, a wireframe, a clickable workflow, et cetera. The other key idea about Lean, which is not intuitively obvious, is something called the pivot. Uh, let me ex explain something um, that I used to live through. In a startup in the 20th century, here's how startups worked. You know, enthusiasm, slide deck, plan that no one read, get funded, lockdown engineering, throw in sugar, you know, caffeine, you know, waterfall development, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, press, launch, more press, first board meeting. Everyone's high-fiving the VP marketing. You got some great press, we used to get press on dead trees, put ink on them, everybody was happy. No one would be looking at the VP of sales first meeting. Next board meeting, board meeting Silicon Valley. Still think it's the same about every six weeks. Someone would finally turn to the VP of sales and pull out that five year revenue forecast that was in the business plan and say how we're doing. And she'd say, oh, back then, excuse me, he'd say, because that was 20th century, uh, he'd say, Great pipeline. <laughs> now only do I get applause in a business school because you all know what that means. When I say this in the engineering school, they go, what, what's a pipeline? <laughs> all right. so, so great pipeline, and that, by the way, every six weeks, that conversation reoccurs. How are we doing? Oh, little revenue, we're not making the plan, but pipeline gonna be great. Oh, the, the orders were deferred to the next quarter, or hurricane so-and-so hit, or whatever. <laughs> Yes, but that was in Bangladesh. What, what did that happen? <laughs> Didn't matter. Now, by the way, you know, as the, the only number we're actually making while this is going on is the expense line. Um, now, depending on the economic climate, your VCs let this go, and if it's a bubble, actually when you need to raise money, your valuation goes up, it doesn't matter. Um, or you sell it to a hedge fund nowadays, I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, but in the old days, you actually cared, and finally one day, you'd open the boardroom door, and no one's sitting next to the VP of sales. In fact, the stench of death is in the room. And the minute he says, pipeline, poof, 
ashes, and a new VP of sales shows up <laughs> and says, what a stupid strategy that was. Boy, what an idiot. And everybody agrees, and the VCs say, yeah, what's the new strategy? And they come up with a new strategy. This continues another nine months until sales still isn't making the numbers. Guess who gets it next? Anybody know? Yeah, VP of marketing, of course. It must be a positioning problem. You just hired the new VP of sales, poof, new VP of marketing. New VP of marketing comes in and says, dumb marketing strategy. <laughs> VCs agree, must have, been, must have been a marketing strategy. But this continues, then you finally fire the, the founder who becomes the you know, chief technical officer, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Does anybody understand what we were doing when we fired that executive? What were we doing? Besides blaming, it was the only time our investors gave us permission to change strategy. That is, the whole history for the first 50 years of startups said we never once questioned the plan. We assumed that the assumptions in the plan were correct. Why? Because the VCs funded it. They couldn't have been wrong. They're not going to be fired. You're going to be fired. It must have been, not, it, there was nothing wrong with our assumptions about who the customers were, whether we got product market fit right or wrong, whether we had the right channel or whatever. No, let's blame it on the individual. Sales just isn't good enough. Now, obviously, that might be the case, but we never once questioned whether our fundamental assumptions about everything, about the hypotheses we had, we never called them hypotheses, because the minute we took money from an investor, that, quote, plan, all those assumptions now became concrete facts. Isn't that kind of crazy? This word pivot now gives us permission to fire the plan rather than executives first. A pivot is a substantive change to one or more of those business model canvas components. We assume in a lean startup model, big idea. We assume that on day one, because all we have are hypotheses about customers and products and channels and pricing and whatever, that most of them are going to be wrong. And so we're actively learning, changing, and refining until we finally find product market fit and think we have a repeatable model. It gives us iteration without crisis and what, what allows startups to look like a blur to large corporations. It allows us to be fast, agile, and opportunistic. We could do this in weeks and months for $100,000. And the cycle time of how fast we do this minimizes cash needs. Uh, so elements of lean startup again, business model canvas, customer development, Agile engineering, pretty simple, right? Uh, by the way, Lean Got Theory, um, as I said, first class was held here ever. First time words Lean, customer development, Agile engineering ever appeared was literally across the hall, across the hall, here at Haas. Uh, I wrote a book, turns out it was my class notes uh, on customer uh, development, which kicked off the Lean startup movement called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Alexander Osterwalder wrote uh, his book on the business model canvas. Eric Ries uh, finally put everything he learned uh, down in something called the Lean Startup. Um, as I said, added the idea of agile engineering. And uh, all this became the cover of the Harvard Business Review on May 2013. If you want to see probably the best summary of uh, what Lean is, uh, just go take a look at that. Lean gets practice, as I said. Um, the first class was taught here and then became something called the Lean Launchpad class at a uh, lesser school down south. Um, <laughs> and, and why I mentioned that lesser school is all those components came together. Here I was teaching th Lean theory in cases. And in this other school, I was teaching in the engineering school, whose students actually wanted to build real products. And so we kind of reconfigured the class into that they had to apply as teams, actually coming in with real product ideas, and what happened is uh, something interesting. I blogged every week of that class, and I got a call driving around campus that kind of went like this. Uh, is this Steve Blank? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Errol Arkelich from the National Science Foundation. Uh, the US government needs your help. A and because I'm somewhat of a jerk, because people will tell you, certainly my students will, um, I said, well, the US government got my help during Vietnam for four years. You're not getting it again. 
he, he said, no, I'm from the National Science Foundation. I said, what's the National Science Foundation? <laughs> and like he see, Errol and I still joke today, he said, I should have hung up right then. <laughs> but instead, the National Science Foundation took the class developed here in the school down south and made it into the, it's the exact class. It's now called the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. If you want an NSF, SBIR, or STTR grant, you take some form of this class now. And I put the lectures online. There are now a quarter million students who have watched it on Udacity. And by the way, the NSF i has just passed 800 teams of principal investigators and their grad students, the best of our scientists and engineers in the US, have gone through this program. Uh, the NIH, National Institute of Health, Adopted it in 2014, I prototyped a version of the class for therapeutics, devices, uh, diagnostics, and digital health at UCSF. And then we ran this class at NIH. Um, elements of the DOD adopted it, and uh, we're doing a new version, uh, uh, again, for national security called Hacking for Defense. But there have been variants of this for almost every um, industry you could imagine. So let me give you an example of how does this really work and then tie it back into corporate innovation. So here's a, uh, an example of a student team's final presentation at Haas this January. And by the way, we don't do a demo day. We do a lessons learned day. That is our final presentation. Uh, I hate demo days. Demo days to me is simply uh, entrepreneurs in bikinis in front of investors. Uh, <laughs> Think, think about that image, and that should gross you out as well, because it just, it just makes, right? You want to take a shower after that. But, but, but truly, if you think about a demo day, if you're an investor in the back of the room, is here's how smart I am right now. And by the way, uh, isn't my font great, and haven't I learned how to project? Well, it tells you nothing about what did you learn, what's your velocity and trajectory, and where'd you get your evidence that like, you actually know anything? Well, you're going to have to believe my slide that always looks like this, and my competitors are on the bottom you know, left, and I'm on the top right. And by the way, you know, since you're all Haas graduates, you can knock out one of those presentations in a weekend. But there's no facts behind them. And so let me show you what a fact-based, evidence-based output of a Lean Launchpad class looks like. So this was a team called Wiser. In 10 weeks at Haas, they spoke to 114 eyeball to eyeball customers. This is not survey monkey, this is not email, et cetera. Um, basically, I believe you haven't done customer discovery if you haven't seen someone's pupils dilate. And the only way you could do that is either in person or with high quality Skype or, or video. Um, and here was the team. And they came up with a initial business model canvas. What they wanted to do is uh, basically sell to hospitals a way to reduce infections by having a high quality kind of hand cleaning and washing for doctors and nurses uh, to reduce the risk in, of infection. And you can see kind of this is a summary of their initial business model canvas. You can see what week this is on the bottom of the slides. Um, basically, they learned very quickly that their business wasn't the hand sanitizers. Their business really was providing accurate data um, to the hospitals. That was a real big idea. They thought they were making hand sanitizers. But gee, the hospitals say, we could buy anybody's hand sanitizers. We just don't have any data about who's using it because um, you know, that's how we get in hospitals, get funded, or get our money back. Um, so they basically removed the notion of uh, save time through easy access to hand sanitizers as one of the key value propositions. And they try to understand who are the customers in the hospital. And they said, well, day one, that was pretty easy. The customers are going to be, you know, the people who use this. And very quickly, as, after they talked to 115 customers, uh, they realized that, no, there are multiple customer segments. There's the hospital medical committee. There's inpatient hospital quality control directors. There's hospital materials and finance managers, IT directors. And then finally, the doctors and nurses and crews who need to be washing their hands. And these all kind of interrelate. They had no idea about this on day one. This is week five. And by the way, they made customer archetypes for each one of those customer segments. They knew none of this on day one. 
Uh, and then they try to figure out, am I in a new market, that is this market never existed, or am I in an existing market? That is a new market might be, this is some kind of wearable thing where I'm collecting data, everybody's wearing badges, and I could figure out when they uh, have kind of washed their hands, or is this an existing market, I'm a compliance data provider? And so they were trying to understand what business are they in? And they started by thinking they were making a sanitizer dispenser cham chamber and this was a product driven company until they realized that no, they're in an existing business which is compliance data collection. The other thing they needed to understand is what's their distribution channel. In week six they got out and tried to figure out how do they sell? Is it through consultants, distributors? Will they have a direct sales force? And they tried to figure out what their sales funnel will look like. On the left, how do they get customers, how will they keep them, and how will they grow them? Again, trying to understand customer acquisition cost, how many hospital visits can a salesman make, how many hours spent per hospital, what's the cost, how much is a hospital visit going to cost, how much uh, pilot hardware would cost, etc., and actually try to quantify customer acquisition cost way before they ever launch the product. And then who else are the competitors? Anybody else doing this or were they just geniuses who you know, figured out hospital compliance? Of course, the thing we uh, ask all the teams if there are trade shows, get your butt out to them because you'll figure out more about com competitive analysis walk in the halls of a show than you will on, on the web. And they came back kind of shell-shocked, realizing, oops, you know, hey, we weren't the first people that, that somebody's laughing because they were in this business, um, that there's more competitors than we thought I could almost write that line for every team. I mean, <laughs> you know, which is good and bad. And now by week eight, they're trying to understand the left side of the canvas. What activities do they need to become expert in? And they discover another basic principle, don't reinvent the wheel to get to market quickly. So, you know, do they need to do R&D for hardware, sensors, and wearables? Or do they need to focus on data and insights? And again, the more they kept talking to the to the hospitals, they were realizing everybody's providing the you know, hardware, no one's giving them data and insights. And so they de de decided to use existing hardware vendors, but actually to add value by building a minimum viable product for a whole system that they could provide a data interface for quality control directors and hospitals. So it went from a hardware, we make hand sanitizers, to holy cow, we're providing high quality data for quality control directors who would pay anything. Big word. We'll pay anything. This is when you go, liquidity event. Um, <laughs> and so, what they realize is hospitals are a business and decisions are driven by P&L and hand hygiene is just one component of a clinical workflow. So um, in the middle of the class, they got a green light uh, by the John uh, Muir Medical Center uh, for uh, actually trialing the product, and they're gonna start building working prototypes. By the way, 10 weeks, 10 weeks. For those of you in large companies, hold this thought, 10 weeks. Let me show you a very different example, same methodology, uh, we using this methodology to now solve national security problems, uh, and we're going to scale this, by the way, to as many universities as we can, much like we did the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. I have the intent to create the equivalent of uh, national technical ROTC in the 21st century with this class. And let me show you, uh, and this is called Hacking for Defense. Um, week one, here was a team um, that uh, basically was working on someone else's problem. That is, the, the difference in this class, same lean methodology, except we use problem sets given to us from the DOD and intelligence community. And this problem set was to solve problems um, related to ISIS messaging. How, in fact, do we understand, uh, target, and then uh, uh, disrupt messaging from adversaries like ISIS? And so the week, week one, the team came in, and the teams, by the way, when you take this version of the class, you show up on day one having already spoken to 10 customers or stakeholders. And within five minutes of the class, you're standing and presenting your initial business model canvas and your results. Uh, there is no intro. Hi, I'm Dave, I'm computer science, I am Sally, that's, that's nice, do that on your time. Uh, on my time, we're hitting the ground. And so they came in already thinking about, here's our minimum viable product, here's our customer discovery, here's, and, and, and in um, 
hacking for defense instead of the business model canvas, it's a mission model canvas that is, there's no revenue for the DOD, but there's what do you want to achieve, and there's no channel, but there's deployment, but the rest of the canvas is almost identical. You could recognize it. And here was who they thought their um, value proposition canvas, the kind of a blow up between the product on the left and the customer segment on the right. Let me fast forward to week five. This is in the middle of the class. Same team. Now all of a sudden they went in and tried to understand their customer in detail. Uh, this is now the Army's ARC Cyber. Actually, this is the entire U.S. government's anti-counter uh, cyber group. When ARC Cyber saw this org chart, they said, uh, excuse us, uh, can we use this org chart? Mm. <laughs> Turns out this is now being used in the U.S. Army as the org chart. <laughs> and then, and since this week, so every week we march the teams through each part of the business model canvas, this was the week figuring out how to get this deployed. That is, much like in large companies, the DOD, Department of Defense, sees a billion demos. I don't care about having this class create demos. I want them to figure out, how do you get stuff really deployed inside the Department of Defense or inside a large corporation? So this week, they were trying to figure out, how do you get funded and actually cut through the entire acquisition and procurement process, which anybody have ever seen the Department of Defense diagram of that, it's about 400 pages long. Um, it turns out they discovered there's a secret way to get funded called other transactional authorities, which allows you to get funded literally in 90 days. 90 days. Uh, and so they discovered what OTAs are. And this one might look kind of a little complicated, but when the Army told these guys, we want you to solve the uh, you know, ISIS social messaging problem, that was literally their description. Well, five weeks into the class, they realized there wasn't a social messaging problem. There were multiple problems, and that no one had actually put them on a graph saying, which problem do you want us to solve? This is now the second slide the Army's now using. <laughs> because they had no idea what the problem was. And the lean methodology, by the way, they're now, they didn't just come up with this in thin air. They've talked to already in week five, 67. Users, stakeholders, beneficiaries, program managers, warfighters, analysts, et cetera, to get here. And they've continued to go through their customer discovery. They came up with um, some potential solutions to the problem. Here were some narratives to the problem. Here was their updated mission model canvas. And now they have details on every possible user. Here's uh, what the uh, operator analyst cares about. Here's what the uh, 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 people on op plans care about. Here's what some more um, analysts care about. Here's what the major and lieutenant colonel think about it, the decision makers. And by the way, you could also use the same tool set for social media and political campaigns, kind of interesting, <laughs> or in marketing, et cetera. Does this make sense about uh, tactically how you do this? Good, so now let me tell you how this works in companies. By the way, as you could tell, lean means uh, getting out of the building. Um, so the problem is, most attempts at lean in the last three to five years in corporations end up as what I call innovation theater. And by innovation theater is, you know, large companies have now kind of looked at startups and said, let's use some of their methodologies. And, and I've started getting called in in the last year or so because CEOs have now noticed, well, we set up the corporate incubator and we have great posters and great coffee cups um, and it's a nice building and we've gotten some great press releases, but we didn't move the needle, top line or bottom line, but great theater. How do we really use lean to make change? So um, let me tell you a world-class example of what happened about 40 years ago when a ultimate Horizon 3 innovation met a Horizon 1 process and procedure and give you a feeling of what, it, what the problem is. So this was a Horizon 3 project. We landed men on the moon within eight years of saying, let's do it, when we had no idea how to do it, where to do it, et cetera. Three astronauts traveled a quarter million miles, spent a week in a little capsule, came back home, pinnacle of innovation. And when they came back home, this Horizon 3 project met Horizon 1 management. <laughs> this is actually Buzz Aldrin's <laughs> customs form. I swear, it's on his website, you can find it. <laughs> Customs.
customs forms. Where'd you go? Cape Kennedy, moon on the left, Honolulu. Anything to declare? Uh, moon rock, moon dust, samples. OK, yeah, I, I could see that. And they had to sign it. You could see it signed. And then uh, you would think they're done, but no, no, nope, had to fill out the expense report. <laughs> Where'd you go? Well, I was in my house. Uh, then I went to Edwards Air Force Base and then to Cape Kennedy. And then from July 19th through the 21st, I was at the moon. <laughs> Then I was floating in the Pacific Ocean until you guys picked me up. <laughs> then I went to Hawaii, back to Edwards, and now I'm in this damn van for 30 days in isolation. Where do you think I've been? <laughs> now, of course, Aldrin put this up because he was pissed. He wanted to be paid per mile, and they paid him per diem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let me explain. This to me kind of like, you know, if there was ever a case of Horizon 3 and Horizon 1 like not talking to each other, what happens here? Well, in startups and more importantly in new corporate initiatives, innovation starts, and it has to start, with no restrictions on plans, processes, uh, or procedures. And success means, whether it's a startup or corporation, finding a repeatable and scalable business model, right? And I've been talking about that a lot. And it grows and scales. One of the things we now know about large corporations and innovation, if you use the Horizon model just as a mental map, you cannot start a Horizon 3 initiative in, its own, in the same building as Horizon 1. Just your normal human nature. It's not a law of physics, but gee, I need some extra budget. There these guys are. I got this emergency in Horizon 1. Take the best people in Horizon 3. Gee, we're running out of money. Ah, let's shut down the Horizon 3. Can't do that. It has to be physically separated with their own plans, procedures, policies, initiatives, and KPIs, and allows them to operate with speed and urgency. Um, the, remember, goal is for Horizon 3 to find a repeatable and scalable business or mission model. And a success path for Horizon 3 is there are three choices. It either gets so large, so quickly, think of Android at, at Google, that it becomes a new division by itself. or it's really growing, but you know what? It doesn't fit our core business. We can't find a home for it. No division wants it. Let's spin it out. Or more than often happens is this is pretty interesting. It really belongs in an existing division. Let's spin it in. And let me take the spin in case because this one has a repeatable set of, it looks like a car crash almost every time. Now, it turns out that when you build a Horizon 3 organization, whether it's a startup or a large company, you create technical shortcuts called technical debt. Anybody ever hear of this term? Right? Uh, the people raising their hand are probably in startups. Right? Technical debt is everything you do that if your engineering school professor had seen it or your business school, they'd hang you. Meaning it's every possible shortcut because you're just urgently trying to get something out and working. But eventually, when the product becomes successful, that like jury rig spaghetti code doesn't scale. And so you've got to clean it up. And that cleaning up is called refactoring. Make sense? Just a special word for clean up the mess you had, technically. In Silicon Valley, technical debt is a known word. But what we really never understood particularly about large corporations, which explains a lot. When you start a Horizon 3 group that actually has now become successful, you've also created organizational debt. Organizational debt says those same people who created that new crazy division, there's no effing way you want them to run anything large, right? Because they'll break everything. And by the way, it's OK. But you need to acknowledge that you've created organizational debt that needs to be cleaned up if you want to spin this thing in. If you don't want to spin it in, then for gosh sake, spin it out or start a new division. And the part that we missed, and we still miss in every large corporation, is this debt part is natural. What, what we still get wrong is trying to spin in a Horizon 3 group into an existing Horizon 1 organization without doing refactoring 
of the technology and the people. And we need a separate small group to do that, a refactoring group. Very few companies have had this light bulb. A refactoring group are actually people who like to take buggy, unfinished code and love to take you know, spaghetti and actually get it into the common standards and quality and whatever your company requires to make it part of the standard product. Does that make sense? This is not exception. Every time I talk to a large company, they go, oh, yes, that must be the only company that runs into this. And the joke is, every company go, runs into this, but no one realizes this literally is only five or 10 people in a 1,000 or 10,000 person division, and almost no company has it. You need a, a process organization dedicated to refactoring. Um, the goal is to actually have this as a continual loop, not as a one-time event. So scale now requires processes and procedures and incentives and KPI, and innovation, if it's spun in, now becomes execution. Now, what's really interesting, though, is those innovators in Horizon 3, the worst thing you could do is now put them inside that Horizon 1 organization, unless you actually want them to leave your company. <laughs> because what you want is a continuous cycle. The founders of a startup and or em early employees of a Horizon 3 organization don't fit into execution organizations. And in short-sighted companies, they leave. In far-sighted companies, you let them start the next cycle of innovation. Make sense? The third part is, when you have these Horizon 3 standalone groups, well, because you're a large company, if you're smart, they're not just quite standing alone. You want to task all the support organizations, finance, legal, HR, et cetera, to work inside those organizations, but not to get them to conform to the Horizon 1 processes, but to get the Horizon 1 organizations to agree to yes. I'll give you an example. We prototyped something like this. Eric Reese now runs this program called FastWorks at GE, but I prototyped the first FastWorks group, uh, what became FastWorks, in the transportation division at GE. Jeff Ilmelt gave uh, this 13-year executive permission to go start an innovative group. OK, I got permission from the CEO. So he starts staffing the group, and he gets a call from HR. You can't take those people. They're not the most senior. <laughs> now, I hope all of you are laughing, not just some of you. Right? So all of a sudden, we got an immediate disconnect that the Horizon 1 rules were trying to be applied to Horizon 3. Does that make sense? You really want it to work backwards. The Horizon 3 folks get to write their own rules the way we make it, make it work, and the Horizon 1 folks only get to veto, veto them if they put the company at risk. And we have a very quick committee decision process to decide that within uh, seven days. Seven working days, we decide whether that, that new rule puts the company at risk. But basically, you want to get to yes. And you want to leverage the existing assets, not just have it as a startup, but actually use the power of your channel, your manufacturing, et cetera. Everybody needs to buy into this process. And the other piece is, when I get called in by large corporations saying, Steve, our, you know, essentially our Horizon 3 stuff isn't working, first question I ask the CEO is, so what's your incentive and bonus program for having Horizon 3 projects? Well, I don't have any. Um, how about your board? Well, they don't have any. Well, how about your exec staff? Well, the guy who runs our incubator. Well, you know, unless um, you're incenting the Mavericks, but also incenting support and adoption, it ain't going to happen. Um, and if there are no Horizon 2 and 3 incentives in the company, then there's no real commitment to innovation. And positive <coughs> could be financial awards. Negative could be you lose some funding for your existing projects. Um, so the goal is to have a continuous circle of innovation in a large corporation. Success means scale. Scale requires KPIs, and an innovation becomes execution. And remember, what Horizon 3 is running here is the lean methodology. Big idea. So why I showed you all that lean stuff? We're not talking about spending years figuring out whether there's an opportunity. You could do that in months. In fact, the most public version of, of this methodology being run in a large corporation is WL Gore. Gore-Tex folks uh, are now shipping some of the first um, uh, samples of, uh, of their output of their uh, uh, lean uh, Horizon 3 activities. I'm going to wrap up in a 
two minutes. Um, so it turns out um, doing entrepreneurship in a large corporation sometimes looks like a Dilbert cartoon. Um, in fact, it, it, it can be. Uh, but it turns out entrepreneurs need to know what the rules are. So it turns out there is a way to be a bad rebel and a way to be a good rebel inside a large corporation. And a woman named Carmen Murata wrote a great book I hand out by the case to large organizations and the government called Rebels at Work. And if you don't have it, you should, uh, it's a quick read, but actually this is the most famous slide from uh, her book. Just as an aside, Horizon 3 protects Mavericks, Horizon 1 fires them. In Horizon 1, Mavericks, entrepreneurs are pains in the butt, they're looking to do something different, they don't get with the program. In Horizon 3, they're the head of your innovation project and they invent your next capability. So with that, um, if you want to figure out how to actually do this, you can take my next class. Um, but I'll, I'll wrap up here and say uh, thank you very much and thanks for listening.